Hi, it's Corey, and welcome to another podcast, the eighth installment in After the Siege, and this is my third reading of the eighth installment of After the Siege, because last night I screwed up and recorded this twice without actually hitting the right button. Um, It's about 9.11, and I'm in London, and I've got a taxi showing up tomorrow at 5.30 to go to the airport, go to Geneva to a DRM standards body meeting, kind of thing that's so dull and evil that you just want to beat your brains out. with any luck while I'm in Geneva this week, I'll get a little writing done on this, because uh, I'm going to read to you right to the end of as far as I've written on After the Siege tonight. I'm going to be in uh, Amsterdam on Thursday for the O'Reilly Open Source Conference. Maybe I'll see some of you there. Here we go. The day after Valentine killed her first man, her hearing came back. The surgery took about ten minutes and was largely performed remotely, reprogramming the hardware in her head with something the doctor called hardened logic. Valentine liked the sound of that. Her hearing came back slowly, in blips and bloops, over the course of a few hours. Then it was back better than new. She found that she could hear sounds from much farther away. The camera woman also showed her how she could use a terminal to access the memory in her new ears, which would buffer six months' worth of audio. Valentine didn't think she'd be in a position to make much use of this feature, as interesting as it was. There weren't any working machines in the city. I'm going home now, she said. Anna was waiting by the printer, making it output clothes and food as fast as it could, giving it to robots to tie up in grip sheets. Would you have turned us in if we didn't help you? Valentine shook her head and tried not to smile. No one would have believed me anyway. I'm not booby-trapped, either. I didn't think you were, Anna said. She gave Valentine a long hug and kissed her cheek. Be careful, okay? Why don't you people help us? Why can't you give our army hardened logic for their weapons? Anna shook her head. She was crying. You think I haven't asked this? To do so would be suicide. Your enemies would never forgive us. It's one thing to chide them for their slaughter. It's another thing to end it. Valentine had Anna print her some convincing rags with bitmapped filth right in the weave and wrapped her parcels in them so they wouldn't be suspicious. She stepped out into the bright light of a spring day, every sound as sharp as a pin drop, from distant gunfire to the nearby hungry whimpering of a baby. She walked slowly through the streets. She passed a spot that she thought was the place where the boy had grabbed her, where she'd done her work with the knife. If that was the spot, though, there was no sign of it. The corpse carriers were so efficient. She walked the stairs to her flat quickly, her full belly supplying her with boundless energy. As she reached for the door, though, she heard something from behind it, some crying. Trover. Once he'd cried non-stop. But he hadn't cried in so long she barely remembered the sound. She swung open the door and saw what Trover was crying about. Mata was stretched out on the floor beside the one chair they hadn't burned for fuel. She wasn't moving, and one of her eyes was wide open, the other squeezed shut. Trover was shaking her shoulder and crying. What? Valentine said to her brother, grabbing and shaking him. What happened? He opened his mouth and let out a howl. He hadn't spoken in a long time. She knelt at her mother's side. Her mother's cheek was cold. Her arms and hands were stiff. Valentine knew that stiffness. Anyone who worked on the corpse patrol knew that stiffness. The front of her mother's torn trousers were damp with cold piss. Valentine could smell it. In Mata's breast pocket there were a couple of inhalers, military grade, the kind of thing you took if you couldn't afford to sleep and if you needed to make your body go. To Valentine her mother looked like a skeleton, something long buried and not freshly dead. Compared to Anna, this woman was very ugly and skinny and hard, too hard to be her mother. She must have taken the drugs to keep herself going when Valentine didn't go home. Maybe she'd gone looking for Valentine. Maybe she'd gone looking for a doctor. Maybe she'd gone to the front to kill some soldiers. Whatever the cause, Valentine had been the reason. It was for her that Mata had killed herself. Valentine pulled Trover to her and hugged him. The little boy smelled of his own shit. 
In her parcels she had the food he needed, so she cut them open and gave him some. She let him eat and covered Mata with some of the new clothes she'd brought home. She knew how to go through a corpse's pockets efficiently. She also knew all of Mata's hiding places in the tiny, grimy flat. Soon she had Mata's identification, her sidearm, her inhaler, her rucksack. There were soldiers Valentine's age at the front. She could pass. Come on, Trover, she said, getting him into a change, change of clothes, putting good, work sho putting good shoes on him. Good shoes would be important. She didn't know how much walking they would do, but it would be a lot. She took him down the stairs, snuffling and weeping a little still, but logy from all that rich food. She led him to the civic patrol office. I can win the war, she said. The woman from the city wasn't so fat any more, but she still had her armor on. She was the one who had told father that he had to go to the war. She didn't seem to recognize Valentine, though. <sighs> Excuse me, it's late at night here. She stared at Valentine. I'm busy, she said. I know a... Uh, Valentine searched for the word. A profiteer who has access to hardened logic that the info war doesn't work against. The woman from the city looked at her a little longer this time. I'm very busy, little girl. I can bring you to him. He has working printers. The woman pretended not to hear him. She stared down at a pile of papers in front of her, and it was clear to Valentine that she was only pretending to read them. Valentine led Trover to the woman's desk and knocked all of the papers off of it. It's illegal to be a profiteer. Don't you want to at least arrest him? I'll arrest you, the woman from the city said, grabbing her wrist. Valentine was ready for this. Her mother had taught her what to do about this. She bent the woman's thumb back and squeezed it until she tumbled out of the chair and dropped to her knees. That's enough, said an old, old hero. He sounded like he was right behind her, but that was just her new ears. When she turned around, she saw that he was in the doorway. He was so old now that he looked like a zombie, and his one arm was pointing at her with shaky authority. Let her go. Valentine released the woman from the city. Do you want to see the profiteer, Valentine said, approaching the hero? Her mother had respected this man, and Valentine decided she would respect him too. I will come with you, he said. Will you bring our guards? He is armed. She thought about it for a minute. I believe he is armed. It will be fine, he said. He showed her the heavy pistol he wore on his belt. My brother has to come too, Valentine said. That will be fine. The old hero walked slowly and carefully. The soldiers he passed nodded to him and saluted him. The old people not smiled and waved. Valentine came to feel proud to be at his side. Normally she was invisible in the city, just another gray, thin face, but with the old hero she was a hero too. And she was a hero. She was about to end the war. The old man spoke creakingly to her as they walked. He remembered her mother and he remembered her father. He told her stories of her mother's bravery in the revolution when he'd been her commander, and she felt her heart race. Valentine was a hero. <sighs> Excuse me, Valentine was a hero like her mother. The wizard would win the war for her. Then they came to his door. The old man didn't need her to point it out. He went and thumped it three times with the butt of his gun. Anna answered a moment later. She was dressed in old rags and had left behind the cast from her leg, limping to the door on a makeshift cane. Hello, comrade, she said. She didn't have the her usual accent. The hero nodded to her. Comrade Anna. He knew her name without being introduced. Oh, sorry. The wizard came to the door. Comrade Hero, he said. Comrade Georg. The old woman shook the wizard's hand. The wizard was wearing rags like Anna's. He had a cunning glitter in his eye, and he took in the street, and he took in Valentine. Hello, Valentine, he said. This girl tells me you have contraband, the old hero said. It's my duty to come in and search your premises for it. Valentine, the wizard said with unconvincing disappointment. The food you took from here wasn't contraband. That was my savings. To the hero, he added, she took the food and I didn't blame her. 
She said surely she was hungry. If I had been a little child in her circumstances, I might have done the same. Valentine squeezed Trover's hand until he whimpered. She didn't trust her tongue enough to say anything. They went into the vestibule and then turned left into a flat. Now, until this time, she'd always turned right when visiting the wizard, but now on the right wall there was nothing but a smooth, unbroken wall, and to the left there was an entirely different flat, barren of furniture as her own flat, small and dirty, and smelling of death. Search away, the wizard said. He tried to put a hand on Valentine's shoulder, and she shied away and dropped her hand to the waistband of the trousers he'd printed for her, where she'd hidden her mother's tiny sidearm. You will find nothing, I assure you. Valentine could see they'd find nothing. All the furniture in the room couldn't have concealed a single tin of food. This wasn't even the right flat. With her amazing ears, she heard the movement. <sighs> With her amazing ears, she heard the movement of the wizard's associates, the documentarians, in the next flat over. I hear them, she said, next door. This isn't the right flat. This is the flat you led me to, the old hero said. It's through there, she said, pointing at the blank wall. It's a false wall. She thumped at it, but it was solid and stony. Tears pricked her eyes. These clothes, she said desperately, plucking at her shirt and trousers. He printed them for me. He has hardened logic printers on the other side of that wall. He could win the war. The wizard shook his head and smiled at her again. His eyes glittered. Oh, if only that were true. To win this war. She looked imploringly at Anna. Anna looked away. The old hero shook the wizard's hand with his one remaining hand. I'm sorry to have disturbed you, comrade. Nonsense, the wizard said. Anything for the city. Come along, the old hero said. Let's leave these people in peace. Trover let himself be led silently into the street, and stayed at her side even when she let go of his hand to silently palm her mother's sidearm. Your mother would be ashamed of you, the old hero said. She wouldn't have wasted the city's time on her fantasies and vendettas. She kept silent. She knew a nearby alley where no one ventured except for people who disappeared without a trace. Though she wanted to shout at him that her mother had died for the city that the old hero had just betrayed, she kept silent. When they passed the alley mouth, she hastily shoved Trover into it. He gave a cry and fell over. She ducked in after him. He's tripped. Help me, she called. The old hero slowly negotiated his way into the alley and to her side. She was holding Trover down as he struggled to rise, but she hoped it looked like she was helping him up. Maybe it did, for the old hero bent at her side, and she stuck the sidearm under his chin and pushed it hard into the wattle of skin there. My mother died for the city, you traitorous worm, she said, her jaws clenching with the effort of not shouting the words. I would kill you right now if I didn't think you could be of use to me. The old hero's eyes were calm. Lots of people have tried to kill me, little girl. Lots of the enemy have tried. How many from the city? Lots, the old hero said. Lots of them, and yet here I stand, alive and well. <sighs> Sorry. I want to go to see the people who fight the info war. I'll kill you if you don't take me to them. You want to do what? You stupid little girl. His tone still wasn't angry. The wizard there is the city's best friend abroad. He's the only reason our enemies haven't crushed us. You want to betray him? I'll win this war, she said. But she faltered. She had thought that he had just been bought off by the wizard, but maybe it was the case that he supported the wizard's work. Was it possible? We will win this war by cooperating with our friends abroad. We can't afford to expose them to risk. I don't expect you to understand, little girl. This is a very deep game. The phrase deep game enraged her so much that she almost shot him there. It was so patronizing. Well, that is tonight's installment, because that is as much story as there is. I have a couple thousand more words, and I hope that they I will manage to write them over the next couple of weeks, and we will be done. Um, so, uh, good night. I'm uh, off to Geneva. You'll next hear from me from either there or Amsterdam, where I'll be at the O'Reilly Open Source Conference on Thursday. I hope to see you there. Good night. Well, well now good night.